This is episode 45 of the Immunology Podcast, the role of podcasting in science. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rout. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have a very special episode of the podcast featuring Brenda and I, along with the hosts of our sister podcast, the Stem Cell Podcast. We all came together to discuss our experience as podcast hosts and where we feel podcasting fits in the science communication landscape. Our good friend at Stem Cell Technologies, Dr. Nicole Quinn, will be leading the conversation. But before we get to that... Immunology 2023, the annual meeting of the American Association of Immunologists, is taking place from May 11th to May 15th in Washington, D.C. The meeting is a fantastic opportunity to showcase your research to a global immunology community. Late abstract submission is now open until January 23, 2023. Visit www.immunology2023.org for more information. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Nicole Quinn, and I am here in Vancouver at the headquarters of Stem Cell Technologies at the table with the co-hosts of the Immunology Podcast and the Stem Cell Podcast. So we have Drs. Daylon James and Arun Sharma, co-hosts of the Stem Cell Podcast, and Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Roud, co-hosts of the Immunology Podcast. Unfortunately, Brenda, although she is in Vancouver, she is isolating in a hotel due to COVID, so she's not physically at the table, but we are bringing her into the conversation virtually. We are going to talk today about one of my favorite topics, science communication and podcasting. You may remember way back in December of 2019, Dalon, Arun, and I had a great conversation in episode 158 of the Stem Cell Podcast about science communication and industry. So we're going to build on some of those themes today, but a lot has happened since 2019, and we're going to talk about podcasting and in science communication and all kinds of other interesting topics. So welcome, everyone. I think we'll start off um, just because we're going to have listeners of both podcasts who may not be familiar with all of the co-hosts, uh, with a quick introduction to each of you, if that's okay. So, Dalon, why don't you kick it off? Uh, I've always been interested in science. I would say I became a scientist in my doctoral thesis at Rockefeller University, where I started studying frog embryology. That led to embryonic stem cells to try to get a glimpse of human embryonic development. And ever since, I've been tumbling down that rabbit hole. Um, the great gift is being able to take part in this podcast uh, where I can continue to tumble and explore that interest. And I was lucky enough to be integrated into the field at a really heady time and an inflection point in science when stem cells were really introduced in, in human for the first time. And it's been a really exciting journey, um, especially in the last few years hosting this podcast. Really excited to be here to share with you guys uh, some of our experiences. Awesome. Thanks, Dalon. And Arun, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Arun. I'm actually a, a new assistant professor at the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. My foray into stem cell biology started way back when I was an undergraduate, when I first heard about these amazing things called induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs. And at that moment, when I was sitting in my dev developmental biology course and heard about iPSCs, I was so enamored. I was just so awestruck by these things, and I wanted to learn all about them and how to make them and apply them. And so then I went into graduate school uh, to study how induced pluripotent stem cells could be applied towards cardiovascular biology, uh, the applications for modeling heart disease and so on. In that context, I actually got the chance to send some cells to the space station. And I've done some projects in space uh, in the years since, which has been a lot of fun. And then most recently, I've been able to work with Dalon and uh, chat with Dalon about all things stem cell biology, not just iPSCs, but the greater field. And I'm just so grateful to be able to communicate the amazing science that the people in our field are doing to the, the greater audience. Awesome. Thanks, Arun. So Jason, co-host of the Immunology Podcast, can you give us a brief introduction to, uh, to who you are and what you're doing? Sure. So I, uh, these days, I'm the senior director of donor medical and analytical sciences at Ceres Therapeutics. So I ended up in biotech through kind of a interesting, atypical route. I, I started being interested in science as a kid, went to college and got really hard into biochemistry, ended up developing all sort of colitis and decided to take my career into the gut. And so I did an MD, PhD, focusing on 
all things gut, some gut stem cell, some gut immunology, looking really at the intersection of those two and was on the academic path until uh, life got really strange one day and then ended up in industry. But uh, these days I spend uh, time both on the business and science side. And more recently now I've been able to kind of take that knowledge and experience and join the podcast world and the realm of immunology and really looking at and, and talking about immunology from a couple of different perspectives alongside Brenda. And I, I, I insist that enterocytes are still an immune cell. They're just a special one and focus on kind of that realm uh, along with my co-host. That's fantastic. Thanks, Jason. And Brenda, please introduce yourself. Well, I am I'm Brenda. I am a postdoctoral fellow at the Netherlands Cancer Institute in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, I am originally from Argentina, where I studied biotechnology uh, before moving uh, to Germany to do my PhD in immunology. Uh, I've always been, uh, so that's where I started my, my journey in immunology. And um, ever since, I've been really very interested in such an, a complex discipline. And uh, I'm currently working on um, T-cell engineering for immunotherapies. And I'm very kind of uh, very happy to have this opportunity of every other week talk about everything immunology, not only in my field, but uh, having the chance to discuss the latest uh, results, the latest papers, and discussing with all these guests with with Jason has been such a such a wonderful experience so far. Awesome, thanks everyone. So, my history with podcasting is that I I, I run the behind the scenes uh, the behind the scenes show of the stem cell podcast and the immunology podcast from Stem Cell Technologies. But I'm really interested to hear about how each of you. Um, got into podcasting. What what motivated you to to take this kind of side gig as a a podcast co host and um, what it's meant to you uh, so far? So I'd love to start with Daylon because he is the probably s senior <laughs> member of this team. He's been doing this this job the longest. So I'd love to hear your your history and kind of what it what it's what it's brought to you. Yeah, Nicole, I just got lucky. I stepped in it. Uh, my closest friend in science, Chris Fasano, uh, who started the podcast when he needed to step away, he asked me to step in, and you were on board for that. And So that's how I got in. It was an opportunity, and I, I jumped at it, even though I was not experienced at all. I think the better question is why I've stayed in it, and uh, mm -hmm. that's because it's been such a great experience and the opportunity to talk to scientists at this level um, it's, it's really unparalleled and it's really been a, a boon for my career, I, I would say, in terms of just recently being promoted. I think it had a large part to play in the, the future of how we practice science. Communication plays a large part. And as stem cells, the profile is raised in, in the public, I think it's more and more important uh, for us to share that knowledge and to, to, to get everyone to buy in. So um, it's, it's a no brainer. Uh, this, this is like my scientific career. Communications has become something that's a passion and a joy, and uh, I do take a bit of a salary uh, because it is some work. But uh, I, I might do it for free. All right, don't share that with the accounting office, but I might do it for free. <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch over to Brenda here because, Brenda, you're the, the – I don't want to say the most junior, but the we'll say we'll say the <laughs> the youngest, yeah, or the earliest in your career. So, what can you give give your history and and kind of what it's meant for you? Well, I I've always been a big fan of the podcast medium in general. Uh, so, I when I had the opportunity to join the immunology podcast, as the same as Dale and I jumped at it. I thought it was such an um, interesting thing to do. I've always liked talking about science and then, you know, actually people listening seemed like a no-brainer as well. Um, as you say, I'm very early in my career. I'm doing my first postdoc. It has been a great opportunity to talk in a different level with people like really big shots in the, in the field and uh, give a completely different dimension to the researchers that we talk to, the guests. And also, I think the opportunity of every week kind of discussing a different side of, of, of immunology, even if it's not directly related to my research. Uh, also, it's always so inspiring because sometimes it's very easy to fall down the rabbit hole of your own research and forget that there's this huge world out there. So I, for me, it was it's like the perfect excuse 
to stay broad and kind of stay inspired by what everyone is doing uh, in the field. Awesome answer. And it's a perfect segue into my next question, which is flipping this around. So we, we've heard what the po- being part of the podcast means to some of the hosts. Arun, can I ask you, what do you think the podcast means for scientists? I think the podcast means a lot to scientists because I think we've become a medium for disseminating science and a way to share their stories. I think that's one thing that perhaps can be done better in in greater science is being able to personalize the people who do the science. You know, we are not just a homogenous group of people in wearing lab coats and siloed into our own little cell culture hoods all day. We are real people with real stories, real backgrounds. And in that, in fact, I think that's one of my favorite parts of doing this show is being able to, yes, of course, talk about the amazing science that the scientists do, but learning about them as people, learning about the trainees as people and learning about what they like to do outside of the science, because that, I think is so closely intertwined with why those people actually start doing the science in the first place. So being able to dissect that, I think is so important. I agree. Jason, do you have anything to add? Well, I think the humanization is is really a fascinating part for, for the guests that come on. They really get to share who they are and not just their work. And I think some of the, the best conversations we have are when we get we get the guests away from just talking about their work like it's a presentation at a conference and into how they got there and the journey and all and all the stuff that you don't see in the paper or that 10 minute conference presentation and so i think that's one value and then as arun said for the guests for this the audience a saying that but b being a source we can catch up on the most recent papers in a broad sense pretty quickly kind of know if you want to go down a path and look at it more. And I think that really provides a valuable service because there's so much information coming out all the time now, it's hard to filter through. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, that's one of the reasons we started the podcast is because we know we know how hard it is to keep current with what's going on. There are you know, thousands of papers coming out every week and very difficult for people to, to really catch up. That's one barrier in science communication that I think is a really obvious one. Brenda, do you have any thoughts on any other barriers? What 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 is stopping people from understanding everything that's going on in their field? What are the barriers in science communication today? Well, if I, if my, I may add the, my own perspective, uh, I think that a big barrier sometimes is the cultural barrier and the kind of the geographical locali- uh, lo- localization of people. And I say I come from the global south, and I think that it's often difficult for people from the global south to access information that, that happens in the big hubs of, of research, the U.S., Europe, uh, or North America in general. And I think sometimes it's difficult for people that are not in those regions to feel part of the scientific endeavor. And I think podcasts like this actually give... Uh, a easier access to research and to researchers, to those people that may also go to a conference and if they're not native speakers in English, they might struggle to keep up with what's going on around them. And sometimes having this this media that's a little bit less formal that they can kind of take at their own pace, I think it's a very important uh, solution. And I think that it's nice for a person like me that comes that has an international background to be access uh, access this and be part of this particular science communication endeavor. So I really like that. Yeah, I I completely agree, and I really value that perspective, Brenda. Just just as an aside, tell us how many languages you speak. Well, I am fluent in three, and I dabble in another two. So I live in the Netherlands now, so I'm learning Dutch. Uh, but I lived in Germany for many years, so I, I speak German, and of course Spanish is my uh, native language, and I would assume my English is also, a, a, you, can, you can assume English is another uh, language I'm mostly fluent in. <laughs> awesome. Such a global person. Dalon, I think you said you had something to add. Yeah, I mean, speaking of just language, uh, uh, first of all, kudos to you, Brent. I mean, I wish I spoke even my language perfectly, but I think one of the problems is the silo of language and the scientific vernacular. I think what's great about the podcast, or at least what I try to do, is to, I don't know, flatten the barriers, to democratize the speech, the way we talk about these things, you know. 
uh, what I loved about this podcast at its inception, and I give a lot of credit to Chris, Dr. Prasanna, who started it, and him and Yosef Gana, is that they talked about science like they talked about sneakers. And, and I love that me and Arun, and I noticed that uh, Jason and Brenda are the same way, as they, their, their passion comes through and their interest, it's infectious. And I, I wish that, that more people uh, in conferences spoke about their science, and, and, and not that it's dry, it's information to convey, I get it, but I love it that we're able to talk about it, like, you know, like we're collecting baseball cards. It's just, it's a lot of fun science and, and you know, in, in the, the language that I do mostly understand, I try to make it more accessible. Yeah, I, I love that as well. Any other thoughts, Arun, on, on barriers in science communication and what the podcasts might do to kind of break those down? Yeah, I think um, one thing in particular is, again, something I reflected on before, but demonstrating that science is not just a global endeavor, but an endeavor done by people from all backgrounds, people from all you know genders, people from all uh, ethnic backgrounds, no matter where you're from, you can be a scientist, you can achieve the highest levels of success in science. And I think one thing that Dalen and I intentionally try to do when we're covering papers in our paper roundups every week or every couple of weeks is highlighting folks from different places around the world, different backgrounds, um, just to show that diversity is a, a hallmark of the modern scientific world. And I don't think that's ever, that's going to change. I think one of the, one of you had said something about, you know, speaking with the greats, the people who, you know, are on the sort of the top of their fields and really humanizing those people and breaking down that imposter syndrome that I think a lot of people feel in science because they don't necessarily have access to the, you know, the, the casual nature of, of many of these scientists. Jason, anything to add to the... Well, to, to take it to immunology a little bit, immunology has a really odd and unique jargon where it's just a list of all the cell surface receptors they stain for to identify a cell. You know, it's CD69 high, CD38, well, like, and they rattle it off. And it, it cr I found that when you're trying, listening to presentations sometimes or going through papers, it's really hard to, to follow because it's not natural human speech. And so what I try to do is when we're presenting this up-to-date work or even talking with the scientists is be like, okay, so this type of thing, what's going on here? And take it that step away to the story, to that baseball card, right? When you collect baseball cards, you don't look at like, oh, there's a picture here and they have this person has this color eyes. Like, the, you know, it's not this microscopic description. It's this is the card of this player, of this story. And so, and so taking the papers and telling the story and the important parts of it to bring it to that accessible level where you still need the scientific background, but you may not need to know everything about every receptor marker or, or flow stain or what's going on, but you can understand the impact, the importance. And then if you need to deep dive, you can, but that that's best done with a highlighter and some time on your hands to grid things out. I want to switch now to, um, to a, a, another personal question. What is the hardest part about being a podcast host. We talk about all these benefits and how, you know, it's been such a pleasure and, and such a, uh, you're so grateful, which is amazing to be these hosts, but what, what's hard about it? What, what have you had to learn and barriers you've had to overcome or, um, Brenda, can I start with you? Yeah, for sure. I think Jason will agree that the hardest part for me is to just keep it simple. You read all these papers and you see all this work that people are doing and you just want to jo showcast everything they did and just, you know, show the, all the, the sweat and tears that came into this. And sometimes it's really hard for me to just focus on the important, the still, and make sure that in the end, what you want to transmit is the big picture and get people excited and, you know, maybe read the paper and maybe go and check their research themselves and do the highlighting and, you know, really get into the d details by themselves. Uh, so for me, has been... Uh, kind of a, a journey on really synthesizing the important things and giving you know justice uh, to the the idea of the authors and the overview of their work. And I think that uh, that's the kind of a topic that is a lot. You you really want to make a good job at on the one hand showing all the work and all the merit of either the paper that you're presenting or the the researchers that you're inviting. But on the other hand, you want to keep it simple and attractive and to the point so that the actual important message gets through properly. So I think sometimes that balance 
can be a little bit difficult. I see Jason saying, you know, just like looking at his phone, I looking at his watch and saying, "Got I gotta cut it down now. I'm like, but I'm only in figure three and they've done so much work. I really want to <laughs> to show all of this. Arun, any any thoughts? What's the, what's the hardest part of the job? Yeah, for me, it's been overcoming my own imposter syndrome in a way uh, to to really view myself as an expert in this field. You know, I'm still I, I'm still very junior, and I it's such a privilege to be able to cover some of these very high profile papers and interview some of these very high profile people. And sometimes I, I still wonder, what am I doing here? Why am I you know, the one talking to this extremely high profile person in, in stem cell biology. And so kind of overcoming that has has taken a little time, but I think I've become more and more comfortable in, in doing it. And I think uh, also being authentic, being genuine to the science that we're covering and being just genuine as a, a, an interviewer, uh, trying not to be so robotic, trying to throw a little humor into the, the conversations that we have. I'm a naturally introverted person, so breaking out of my shell has taken a little time, but I like to think I've gotten better at it. Do you think uh, your academic training, which I think we can all agree really teaches you to present yourself in a specific way, using specific language and a specific demeanor, do you think you've had to break down some of that to to open up a bit? I, I think so. I, I think it's almost like I, I feel like I'm living two lives in some ways. I feel like in my academic demeanor, you have to have like a very professional presentation and the way you present your science, whether it's at conferences and stuff like that. But outside of my academic life, in when I'm talking to science with my parents or with my friends, it, it's a completely different style in conversation. So I'm trying to marry those two styles in some way. It doesn't always work, but I think being accessible is something that I've tried to work on a lot. Daylon, how's he doing? He's doing great. I mean, he's way ahead of me. I got to tell you, Arun, that imposter syndrome doesn't go away. And uh, for me, I mean, all evidence to the contrary, I really hate the sound of my own voice and it's excruciating to do this at times. I mean, even in the moment, I'll be like, I can't believe that these words are coming out of my mouth. And I just want you all to understand as listeners that there is a bit of, of risk involved and you kind of do have to put yourself on the line and, and you know, make bold statements uh, that, you know, sometimes are a little bit off color. So please be generous in, in the future. We're trying our best to entertain you while also educating and informing you and, and sharing our opinions. I mean, what we're trying to do is stimulate discussion. But for me, it can be excruciating. I hate to listen to podcasts. Um, and, you know, I, I have to say it's a struggle every time I show up, but the, the rewards are, are totally worth it. Jason, anything to add? What's the hardest part? So, so my joke answer was getting the audiovisual equipment to work the first three <laughs> episodes um, and, and setting all that up. But, but in all seriousness, I find the hardest part is, is getting those magic moments from the guests. So, so there's an art there I'm still learning of when you're interviewing someone, especially when they're not in the room, right, since we do most of our interviews uh, uh, by Zoom, of trying to coax out that from that scientist who's really comfortable talking about the data, that personal side. And some people jump naturally into it, but others don't. And so how to bring that conversation forward and out of other people and that in that type of interviewing. And I find I, I keep ending up having to go back to my medical skills of how you interview patients to try to get that and try to kind of build really quick, really deep trust in a 30 or 40 minute conversation to get some of those things out. And so I, I found that's where the, mo the most difficult part for me has been. You had to channel your inner, inner Oprah Winfrey <laughs> trying to get that magic of, of getting people out. Um, okay, what we'll, we'll flip back again. So what has been your favorite podcasting moment so far? Or maybe what's the fit your favorite thing to do to, to, to draw out that magic? What's your favorite question to ask if you can't think of a specific moment? Jason, do you want to keep the mic? Sure. So when we talked to Carl June and, and then he started describing how his life got to where it was and and then the the impactful moments that he had early in his career that set him down his path, I think that was one of my favorite moments just because you could see we knew the end of the journey. Well, well most of it. There's, there's still more story, obviously. Tell, tell the, the the stem cell yeah. folks who don't. Sure. So, so, so Carl June being the kind of the godfather of CAR T cell therapy. Um, 
was a military uh, guy who who ended up in the military, ended up doing research, ended up working on T cell receptors, and essentially, it wasn't by fluke, but it was he, he just kind of went down a path and then spun this military career into a fabulous scientific career. But it, but it showed, and I think that that's the magic of the story that I relate to is that no matter how deliberate you are in your life's plans and you're going to do A and then B and then C, and scientists like the plan, right? You got your experiments, your reagents, you do it and then everything happens, right? That's not what happens in life. And so listening to how his story also meandered and went through all, all the various parts of his life to, to get to, to the type of success he sees and the people he met on the way kind of, kind of shows you what life is really like at the end and that, and, and then just talking to a person who has that level of contribution and then hearing about it is like, I had no idea what was going to happen mm -hmm. <laughs> type of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Brenda, do you, do you recall that episode? Is that one of your favorites too? Or do you have another one you want to you wanna have? I mean, I definitely enjoyed so much our conversation with Carl June. And I think with he, I also approached these so stories with so much humility and uh, he's, I work with cell therapy. So for me, he's one of the, really references of the field so getting to talk to him in such a one to one situation was amazing and i it was such a great thing to just hear about his story and 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 just see where he ended up i also had but i like that in general i think there's also other other guests that we've had on uh, on the podcast that have been working on for many years i started in the 80s and and when nothing was known of immunology and i think that's as a very kind of early uh, kind of one of these uh, generation of scientists that we, a lot of the fundamentals have been there for as long as we've uh, we've known. But these people, they they started when so little was known. It's so great to actually have this kind of living memory. I make them sound very old. They're not that old, <laughs> but but it's like it feels a little bit like that because you you were so used to all these things being known uh, that having the chance to hear it from kind of from the horse's mouth in a way how everything started 30 40 years ago it's it's so wonderful but i also what i also really like and it's maybe not the podcast itself but we often end up talking with the guests a little bit longer after we're done recording and and it's also such a great opportunity to talk to them uh and, and learn a little bit from them often we end up talking about our research or um uh, kind of a footnote from from our discussions during the interview uh, it's it's great especially over over the, the pandemic we couldn't meet anyone we couldn't go to conferences so this was the as a starting postdoc this was the closest i got to you know chit chat over a over a, a coffee in a conference it was really invaluable such a great experience awesome Daylon, you've got a long history here. Are you can do you have a moment you can dig back and Oh, okay. for sure. I mean, I think it's it's the idea, right? We 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 like to say at the orientation, it's like not the conversation you have with the audience on the dais, it's the conversation you have with your study group at the bar. Um, and that's the conversations you get to have with these people who are, you know, rubbing shoulders with Nobel Prize winners or winners themselves. Um, one in particular that jumped out at me was Janet Rassant. We had a great conversation. And as Jason was kind of alluding to, you, you, you listen to these great scientists and you think, I guess it's a curiosity that you think maybe you could replicate their success, but that's not even it. I think you're just trying to unearth how arbitrary the path can seem and how you know, a, a great illustrious career can start from just a point of interest or how there could be 10 people who are all in a room together and nobody's, and now those same 10 people or on the shortlist for the Nobel Prize. It's these curiosities of how you get this quorum effect among scientists. I think it's like it's scratching an itch for me. It's like, how does it work? How do you get great insight and great innovation? Um, and talking to these people, you don't get it. You don't understand how you could replicate it, but at least you can you know, bear witness to the glory of you know, making truth out of ignorance. It's one of the most invigorating things I think any scientist will report to you seeing something for the first time. It's enough even to hear about someone else tell how they saw something for the first time. It's great. Every time we can capture that moment with the scientists, it's priceless. Awesome. Awesome. Arun, any other thoughts? Your favorite moments? Yeah, I would say my favorite moment has been outside of the context of a particular episode. It was actually 
during our meet and greet session at the International Society for Stem Cell Research meeting this year, when we had a number of very junior trainees come up to us and tell us how much the podcast actually meant to them in such a formative time in their career. You know, the fact that we were able to be there, be in their ears as they're doing their routine cell culture every single day and that we're actually providing them some value and also providing them a platform to actually share their stories because a big part of what we do on our stem cell podcast is highlight junior trainees, either by highlighting their papers or also by uh, inviting them on the show. And so that really you know, took me by storm and it really made me emotional actually because I thought to myself, wow, I'm actually having a very positive impact on these young scientists lives. That meant so much to me. Yeah. From your home studio, talking into a microphone, Yeah, you know, it, it just, it's, it's, I even sometimes forget that it's going out into globally, like Brenda says, you know, mm-hmm. that it's humbling. access it all yes. over the world. It's a humbling uh, yeah. responsibility that yeah. I should take more seriously. Arun <laughs> takes very seriously. <laughs> Any anyone else have any thoughts on the I'm switching questions here on the impact that um, or have you had any any feedback on the impact you've had on trainees or on on the listeners? Jason, I saw you nod there. I've had people come up to me at conferences as fans. I've had faculty and Brenda and I both experienced this. Who the guests who've come on say, "I'm a giant fan of your podcast. I never thought I'd be on it. Mm -hmm. This is amazing." And our podcast is still pretty young. And then. To, to actually get the, some of these giants who are listening to it or emerging giants and is excited. And then, and then like the responsibility of it. Yeah. I, I try not to think about that too much in the moment. Otherwise I'm sure it'll be paralyzing, but like the fact that you, you're casting and it goes out there mm-hmm. and it's there forever, which is also kind of an interesting. Oh. <laughs> Brenda, do you have any stories? Forever. <laughs> Well, I, it's also been f- fun for me because I, I didn't very much, um, I didn't really tell anyone I was doing this at work. So only my, my supervisor. And then, so I, I had some point people, I see people in my institute and they walk to me and they're like, you have a podcast. I've been listening to you for weeks and only now I realize it's you. <laughs> and I had one person tell me that they joined the lab after listening to our conversation with the PI in the podcast, that helped them decide that they wanted to uh, to contact this person for for an internship. So I that made me think that you know it's going places. People are listening and paying attention, and it's so fun to hear that. Mm-hmm. I'd love to to ask about. Um, we've talked a lot about the role podcasting plays in science communication. What does the future? Of science. I think we were pretty early into this podcasting space. There's a few other science podcasts that have popped up, which is fantastic. You know, more accessibility to people around the world. What does the future of science communication look like? How is it changing and why is it different from maybe the, the ecosystems we all grew up in through in, in academia? Daylon, any thoughts? Well, I am famously... Uh, a Luddite. That's my like identity on the show. So don't talk to me about the future. Uh, but I, I will right. say... Wrong person to ask. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, what I like uh, about the, the trajectory as I'm in the present of it is that it seems like there's a lot more room in, in, the, in, in the realm of communication and, and special interest in these really niche uh, audiences, I think that the, the podcast underscores. I mean, my father-in-law tries to listen to the show and says that he can't understand anything, and I appreciate that. But I, I've learned to not care about the numbers. I, I think reaching that individual um, is is critical, and it's enough. And I think that that's what's great about the future of science is that there's there's room for niche audiences. Uh, there's a platform for uh, creators of content, and I think it it carries over to science as well. I think there's a lot more diversity of not just scientists, but the the types of science that's done, and we're making room for all of it, which is amazing as it continues to grow that there is room, but I think there's more focus and attention, particularly in stem cells because the the upside is is so great, and the the future is almost now, pretty much, Mm -hmm. with some of these uh, trials coming to fruition. So it's an exciting time right now. Forget about the future, Nicole. We're living it. <laughs> Jason, what does the future of science communication look like to you? 
So I'm not going to stick to stem cell or immunology or, or anything else here, although we could argue that immunology is uh, having a heyday right now, especially with you know, the various viruses running around the universe these days. Uh, but I think the journal system where that used to be the main mechanism, there were a few big journals, there were only so many papers coming out, everyone could just read those parse it for the articles they wanted and call it a day that that we've known is kind of not viable anymore. And but it's getting worse and worse as more and more data and more and more scientists are being produced. It's not a bad problem to have, but it's a problem that needs a solution. And, you know, there's various aggregators, but there, there's something to be said for for different media. And so having a, an auditory media where you can absorb and learn about science while on a walk, while mowing the lawn which is why I do a lot of my podcast listening. While, while living your life in other ways, I think it becomes an invaluable service to try to distill what's going on. And then also, especially in modern time, and I, and I think this is particularly true of immunology, scientists have become front and center very recently, um, politicized or not, but just generically speaking, this, this concept of scientists coming forward and addressing issues of concern I think it's important to then understand who these people are on, on, on other media and platforms and really, and as we've talked about, humanize what, what it is to be a scientist in that journey so people can understand what's going on. You know, we've had it in like, you know, biographies of athletes and celebrities for years and even politicians, but, but not scientists. And now scientists are becoming more front and center. So I think it's more needed. I agree. I think people need to understand that, you know, that humanity that, that part of science that we've, we've talked about. Arun, I know this is a, a topic that's really, you know, of interest to you. Uh, what, what's going, what's, what's happening in the future? What do you look forward to in science communication? Yeah, I think it's something that we've reflected already here today, which is the democratization of science and making it so that you don't necessarily to be, have to be a PhD level trained science to talk about science. This is a perhaps a good and a bad thing as we've been reflecting on during the midst of the pandemic. But I, I think bringing science to the greater world is a good thing in general. I actually have friends who have become professional science communicators. Um, you know, they, they are PhD level trained scientists who have entirely shifted their careers and are, no longer do bench science, but just talk about the science on either YouTube channels or other forms of social media. And we need that. I think we really need that, especially for the younger audiences, to show not only can anyone be a scientist, but that science isn't something that's exclusive to the nitty gritty scientific journals, but can be distilled in a way that's approachable for even a high school or a middle school or elementary school or even my two year old. It depends on how good of a job you do in, in talking about it. So I think it's a skill that will be in higher and higher demand as time goes on. Brenda, any thoughts to add? I think I think the relevance of you being on the other side of an ocean um, is is interesting too because of I mean we spoke before about the globalization of of science communication. But any thoughts on what the future of science communication looks like and how it's different from what we've experienced? I agree with everything that the other guys say said. Uh, I definitely think that there is a huge need and a huge uh, benefit of science communication in general. So, and I think there's kind of a difference between science communication for kind of everyone and the importance of bringing science and scientific thought into everyday life and into policy. I think that's fundamental into decisions that are made for, for the good of society on the one hand. And on the other hand, the importance of bringing science communication to scientists throughout the world and to try to democratize access to science and bring the necessarily necessary networks and the necessary knowledge to everyone doing science throughout the world. And I do hope that the future of science means that scientific knowledge and scientific access is expanded better outwards from the center of 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 kind of scientific um, gen data generation uh, and that. Now, due to all this new uh, access, especially after I think, if anything, the pandemic gave us is a better understanding of how easy it actually is if you put some effort to reach even virtually throughout the world. 
And I hope that the future of science communication means that people from all over the world can access better and more scientific information and feel part of the conversation better. Not only being diverse within like the U.S. or within Europe, you no, know, this, this this place is accepting and 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 encouraging people to pro, to contribute to their scientific um, societies, but also exporting more and getting allowing people to stay in their home countries while still doing important research that not only solves their own scientific um, kind of uh, hunger, but also helps the helps the societies improve their life uh, quality and their own. Um, yeah, their own, what would be their own heritage and in, 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 in knowledge mm -hmm. within their countries. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I'm going to switch. Um, we're going we're gonna to wrap up with a big question I want each of you to comment on. Um, and I'm going to kind of combine two questions in one. So I'd love to hear, we, we often ask our guests on, these, on the two podcasts the same question, which is what is the, the bit of career advice you would give to trainees? And I'm going to combine that with, what shift needs to happen in order for trainees to have more success? And you can kind of maybe comment on both or separately. Uh, I'm going to go with Arun first, as you're, you know, you've got a new position. And so I know a lot of, a lot of people are going to be asking you, how'd you do that? <laughs> what's, what's your, what's your advice? I would say be comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's something that was taught to me, you know, early on during my career, not just in terms of the science that you do, but in terms of the people that you talk to, in terms of the platforms that you utilize. I think junior trainees are starting to realize that, you know, you can you can have a voice much more easily these days in science than what might have been possible in the past, in part because of platforms such as podcasts or Twitter or other forms of social media, you can become an expert and you can be a source of information and knowledge for not just fellow trainees, but for the greater scientific community. And I think it's important to be able to embrace that, to kind of break down the so-called ivory tower associated with academia. I mean, I'm, I'm an academic scientist and traditionally, I think the power structures in academia have been very much weighted towards the senior level. I do think that's starting to break down and I think things like podcasting is doing a good job in breaking that down. So I think just for the trainees listening out there, just be uncomfortable and be comfortable with being uncomfortable um, and just follow, follow your passions and see how far that takes you. I completely agree. I'm going to go over to Jason. Jason and I share a, a commonality that we both left academia for industry. We work very different capacities in industry, but I'd love to hear your advice, Jason. So in addition to being uncomfortable and being okay with it, I think it's knowing that, especially during training, the advice you often get are going to be, are from people around you and people who are around you are comfortable with what they know. And so that inherently creates a, a worldview that if you're in academia, you're going to be really comfortable with academia. And, and so it's on you if you have broader interests to an extent to really reach out and understand the broader world around you. And I think things like podcasts make that easier. And some places are getting better at exposure. But in the end, regardless of how good a place is exposing you to something that they don't know a lot about, people are comfortable with what they're comfortable with. And so if you want to see the larger world, you should reach out, be comfortable with being uncomfortable, asking people in industry or in government or in other careers, at conferences, friends, family, be open to that curiosity. And also, I think the, the biggest thing that I, I had to learn, and I'm a planner, being an MD, PhD, I like eight and 14 year plans, right? Like I had an eight year, <laughs> had an eight year educational plan, it was great. And then I was gonna have an eight year <laughs> residency and postdoc plan, and that was gonna be great. And then partway through that second half of that plan, it all kind of went sideways. And if you look at any of the careers, the stories that we hear from the, the, these scientists or in most people's lives, it looks like a straight line from point A to B, but it's not. And, and there's, and you have to be comfortable with that, that uncertainty and the free fall and the different ways life will take you and be true to yourself and what you really, really like. And so I always wanted to be an academic for a long time because of, you know, things A, B, and C, but in reality, I could find those things A, B, and C in lots of places. And so I'm just as happy now 
with what I do, but that's because I never really moved from doing what I wanted to do. I just changed where I'm doing it. And it was learning that in the broader world, that that could be true, that it wasn't just one place that could offer those things. I think you'd hear a very similar story from many, many people who work with me at Stem South. So I completely agree. Brenda, you're the most junior in your career here, but you're you're also the closest to grad school, which you know we've all been through and we all know is is tough. So what would you give, hmm. um, you know, as somebody who's on the other side of that PhD, but still working through the academic sort of trainee system, what, what advice would you give? Oh man, it's, it's difficult for me because I feel so junior. It's like, what could I possibly, what kind of advice could I possibly give? But I think, uh, Arun mentioned this imposter syndrome. And I think that's, even I have to tell myself sometimes you gotta tone it down a little bit. You're if you're here, then you belong. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Um, and I think it's 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 important to yeah to kind of trust yourself uh, in a way. And I've had my I had my my good uh, dose of doubts and and kind of conflict throughout my career. It's not been easy. Also moving uh, overseas for my studies. And I think that is also the reality of probably many listeners that we have uh, that you do you you give out give up a lot to to pursue this 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 passion that it's science and academia and just being surrounded by similarly minded people and a lot of us sometimes wonder whether it was all worth it when you're away from your family when you are missing a lot of the things that your friends or like people you leave behind are, are going through. So I think my advice, the thing that has kind of carried me this far is trust yourself. And if, if an opportunity looks good, uh, take it, don't, don't wait for permission. And I think that was my case with signing up for, for hosting this podcast. It was at the beginning was a little bit of, um, of, a uh, of a decision I took, I thought, well, why not? Like, I really thought this was something I, fun I wanted to do. Um, and I I told myself that if that was good enough, that was a good enough of a reason to, to do it. And I'm really glad I did. And I'm trying to apply that more to my everyday life and to my career in general, because sometimes it's hard. It's hard to feel entitled to take, to grab kind of the bull by the horns and say, this is what I want. And this is what I'm going to do. And I know better what, what's good for me. I love it. I love everything everyone's saying. Daylon, recently tenured professor. Hmm. What, what, what were they thinking? <laughs> what, <laughs> what would you like to share with our listeners? I mean, I, I don't know that I should be giving that much advice to anybody. But the one thing I feel is that the, the young trainees just got to hang in there and I can remember being young and all I wanted was to do something great. And I think in, as I've matured a little bit, I've recognized that it starts with doing something well uh, and doing something, you know, in the right way. So you get to the right truth and it might be great. You know, the greatness kind of uh, reveals itself as time marches on and you never know um, where it's going to come out. But if, if you focus on what you're into, you'll always be happy. So hang in there. Sometimes you look around, it seems like everyone else is doing the great science, you know, focus on yourself. And I think that your day will come because as you were saying, Nicole, what's the problem? I think that historically there's been this, uh, kind of allowances made for cannibalization in science where it's okay for senior people to take advantage of, of younger trainees at every level um, and to burn them out uh, in pursuit of whatever greater truth at the expense of their own future. Uh, and I don't think that's right. And it's never been right, but I think that we've all been looking the other way. But now I think the tables are turning. There's a lot more opportunity for trainees to do other stuff. So I think you're gonna have a lot of people left you know, looking for someone to take advantage of. And, and when they can't find someone who's gonna get in line for that, I think they're going to recognize that you need to make uh, more allowances. You need to have a cultural shift in science training where we appreciate the backs on which all this science is built. Um, and when that day comes, maybe stick around in academia for me, all right? Go <laughs> dabble in industry. But I think there's a real future in academic science more than anything because the academic industry hybrid 
it is a thing more than ever. So again, just hang in there, uh, do good work and, and do what you love and your day will surely come. That, that last point you meant, you said that academic industry hybrid um, is something that's very dear to me because if I could add my little point of advice, it's that it's not as separate anymore. We're all here to push science forward and we all have a different role to play and whether you do, you know, as Arun was speaking about his friends who have completely left research and, and devoted their lives to communication or whether you're completely in the clinical side of things in academia or sorry, in industry or, or you know, like myself working in, in marketing and communications in industry, which I never thought I would do. Um, and I love it so much. I think that keeping keeping your eyes open, talking to a lot of people, making sure you understand the new opportunities that are there that maybe weren't when, when as Jason says, your mentors grew up in academia is, is really important. Um, so with that, I think we're going to wrap up. So thank you, each and every one of you. Thank you for joining our conversation. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for hosting the podcast. Thank you for doing what you do for science. And uh, take care, everyone. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Podcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests, including yourself. See you next time.